Hello everyone, uh, welcome to 26 Calabar. Uh, it's very nice to see you in 2023. Happy New Year, by the way. Uh, we have planned a lot of surprises, meetups meet uh, for, for this year, but we'll learn it on the way. Uh, this meetup wouldn't be possible without the help of our sponsors. Uh, Sumo Logic, we are in the office of Sumo Logic, so there's also some swag by Sumo Logic over there if you like to pick up, uh, and uh, iterators. So uh, please give them a warm round of applause for making it happen. Thank you. Uh, so plan for today, uh, we'll have a uh, first presentation uh, by Martin. Uh, then we'll have a uh, uh, networking break sponsored by Smologic. Uh, then we'll have a second presentation by Michal. And after that, we'll have after party at Uwaga Pivo. Uh, Tomek will lead you there, but it's easy to find on Google Maps anyway. Okay, without further ado, uh, Martin, warm welcome. Um, hello everyone, um, it's such an amazing thing to uh, be here in person uh, um, for the last few, 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 few months or few years at least. Uh, we all been uh, remotely and uh, I think it's not the same. I've been like recently for a few uh, in-person meetups and it's, it's way, way better. I don't know your feelings but uh, at least for me it's, uh, uh, it's, it's so much better. So um, I'm happy to, to be here um, in person. Okay. Um, so, quick question um, before we start the presentation today. Uh, how many of you uh, work on the compiler uh, or things like inventing new um, type system or inventing new monads or, or things like that? Can you, can you raise your hand? Okay. Okay, me neither. So, um, the thing is, you know, on my daily job, I do some basic stuff way more basic than, you know, um, inventing new, um, new, new um, IO monad or, you know, creating things like uh, mm, more complex frameworks or libraries. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about how to save time by letting Scala ecosystem um, work for you. So basically, how fast can we, you know, build, like, build a new microservice maybe expose some metrics, consume some JSONs, maybe publish something to, you know, to Kafka, add some basic logic, um, you know, have some metrics that Prometheus can consume or, you know, um, um, it's like um, within the open API standard and so on. Um, so, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, before we even start creating new, new service, uh, which we'll do, mention things, um, we have to like ask few few questions. So, um, what's the state of the Scala ecosystem? How many libraries we have? How well documented are they? Um, are they battle tested? Um, are they tested at all? You know, are they maintained? You know, are they open sourced? Or we have to pay like huge, huge, um, and crazy money for for using this? Um, can we, if we decide to go with one type of um, type system or, or library, can we easily integrate them? Can we work on multiple stacks or we have to, you know, um, commit to one stack that maybe have some, um, some, hole, some holes or gaps um, that needs to be filled? Um, so what can, we, what can we actually achieve with what we have um, in Scala? And uh, one of the most important metrics or one of the most important questions actually is how fast can we write business code? Because at the end of the day, most of us, I think, at least it's, it's in my case, we have the man manager or, you know, we have a task in, in whatever um, task tooling you, you use saying, okay, expose this endpoint, consume this JSON, validate this um, in that way, and maybe, you know, save something to database and, uh, you know, do some, um, um, expose some metrics, um, you know, consume, uh, consume JSON from, uh, or make a request to another service, wait for the response, you know, um, consume this, you know, if it fails, then throw this error or return this code. And maybe add some logging on top of that. All right, 
so these are the people that create all the like great libraries, you know, uh, Scala tooling, um, IO monads, and, and all the stuff. These they are gods for me. But actually, this is me. You know, I come, um, I wake up every morning, and I sit at, uh, in front of my desk, and I start, you know, using these things, um, trying to use them as building blocks for as the machinery for things that I want to, um, I want to achieve. So I'm a very simple, very simple developer who obviously makes mistakes. Therefore, I want to use Scala because it's strongly typed language that we that we all that we all love. So um, my name is Marcin. Uh, I'm a freelance software dev. Um, have six years of uh, experience doing commercial de development, and I'm with Scala for for three years. So that's what I do during the day. Uh, nightly, I'm trying to you know do some open source um, contribu uh, contributions uh, and write some blog posts or prepare some conferences and meetups or prepare some talks for these conferences, conferences and meetups. All right. So today we will mostly focus not on the core, not on the, on, not on the business logic that you might have in your system, but on things like um, top layer of the application, which in our case will be API layer. So we will go through things like um, declarative API. How can we declare our endpoints, treat them as data, you know, what options are there, um, and what it actually gives us in terms of um, developer experience. Uh, we'll have a look at codecs and serializers, things that will allow to consume as um, our entities. Uh, they might be, you know, um, it might be JSONs, it might be XML, maybe for some, for some cases. We'll see if actually these things are, uh, have some type safety built in. We'll have a look at things like middleware. What can we do with uh, middleware? Maybe we want you know, to change some HTTP codes in, the, in, the, in our application. Uh, you know, maybe we want to add things like CQRS cores. Maybe we you know, want to add some custom headers, things like that. We'll have a look also how can we, how can we test the stuff, um, whether writing specs is, is easy or, or not at all. Um, and we'll also have um, you know, a look at um, things like metrics, uh, maybe uh, tracing IDs, integrations with, with other um, libraries, um, functional error handling, performance, gRPC, fast deployment, and, and web sockets. Okay, so this, this is like stuff that you know, most of us um, use on a, on a day to day. Um, basis when it comes to the, you know, um, talking to microservices or exposing some, some APIs, right? Uh, so out of all these things, I want to focus on these uh, six points. Seven points, sorry, I cannot count. Okay, so I want to focus on API description, um, HTTP server possibilities, um, and DT serialization and deserialization, some docs that we want to have uh, and we don't want to write them by hand, um, testability of our code, um, metrics, and HTTP clients that will allow us to call another, another service. Okay. So in terms of servers, there are many, many possibilities. Um, we could compare them if we want. But today we will focus mostly on HTTP4S and uh, it's because mostly it's, uh, I'll, be, I'll be showing you type level stack. So things that are, um, have mostly dependencies to, to CAS and CAS effects. Okay, but if, you, if, if for example someone is using uh, or wants, wants to use like Armeria backend or you know, um, Akka because you haven't migrated yet um, or, or Zio for whatever reason, uh, that's totally fine. You can use this as well, but it will not be um, part of this presentation. We will maybe have some snippets, but it, we will focus on HTTP4S uh, today. Okay. So why HTTP4S? Why should we focus on this? Is it the best uh, player in the game or not at all? So four key 
um, things that decides that decide that um, HTTP for us is is great, and uh, it's I think it's uh, commonly used in the in the um, ecosystem. So um, typeful. It means that HTTP for us servers and clients um, share in an uh, immutable model of uh, both requests and responses, obviously. Uh, everything like standard headers, everything is modeled uh, um, as like semantic types, okay? Um, it's pure functional, um, it's pure functional in its nature, um, which means that uh, IO is managed by um, cat's effects. It's built on top of FS2, which is a streaming library that provides um, you know, processing and uh, emitting large uh, payloads um, in constant space. And it also implements WebSockets. And it's cross-platform. So it means that um, it cross-builds for Scala Native and Scala JS if you, if you use them. So just to have the you know, um, starting point, uh, all you need to um, configure is to add these um, things to your, to your um, build file. Um, I'm using S, um, SBT uh, as I think most of us, so uh, it's, it's pretty easy to, to have them. We'll, we'll use HTTP for us DSL, which is a um, rich DSL that will provide us um, naming and, and all the stuff that we need to uh, describe how our, our um, server will, will look like. Um, also, CRC generic and HTTP for us CRC, which are helpers for the um, entity encodings. And I've chosen the uh, Blaze server in this case, but HTTP for us supports uh, multiple of them. So if you have any other preference, that's um, totally, totally fine. OK, um, as you can see, Okay. As you can see, um, HTTP for us, um, apart from Blaze, they offered um, other things like Ember, uh, Feral, um, Servlet as well. So depending on your, on your needs and uh, what you want to have, um, you can you know, choose between them. But I think like, one of the um, great advantages of Blaze is that it actually um, has a WebSock, WebSocket server. Um, and uh, uh, HTTP client build, built in, so we don't have to use other things, but we will use them anyway because I think um, for the sake of um, enriching our uh, stack, it's, it's worth to have a look and be aware of what's out there. All right, so before we start, um, let's um, define some domain that we will um, use in the some code examples, so we are all on the, same, uh, on the same page. So we have a book that has some properties, including author, which is um, uh, another case class. We'll have uh, two services, book service and author service. Um, we are not injecting them through interfaces. We are just you know, um, using them um, directly hard-coded because um, it's just a demo. It's not a production code. Okay. All right. So um, I like the pointer. So as you can see at the, at the top, the, this is the definition of um, something that, that these guys that I have uh, shown you at the, at the beginning, they call it classy. Whatever classy means in the functional programming, it's not so important. Because what it means, this thing, is a server is a function from a request to, um, to response, but for not for everyone, not for every request will have um, a response, so that's why it's wrapped in option. And obviously the, the response will execute a factful code. It will either talk to DB, it will either talk to Kafka, it, will, it might talk to um, another service, uh, is, is some client or you know, maybe send some gRPC. That's why we, we wrap this in the, uh, this um, inside of the uh, monad um, F. So 
one of the vast majorities um, of um, people and contributors, they love DSL of HTTP 4S because it's e really easy to write and um, basic server and um, read them um, once someone has, has written um, the server and the definition of, of endpoints. So it's a partial function that um, has a tuple of the HTTP method and the path that will be, um, that will be called. And we wrap the, uh, whatever our service returned um, inside of the um, OK um, method that um, has all the um, proper code and everything and call it inside. So it's pretty easy. We don't have to bother about, um, we don't have to think about um, anything else. Okay, what if, we, um, what if we want to do some more advanced computations or we want to have you know, some uh, query parameters in our path? How can we, sorry, how can we, um, how can we decode them? So um, for the, if you want to pass author as the uh, parameter because it's our uh, own data model, all we have to, all we have to do is to add uh, this definition that ex will extend query param decoder matter um, we've defined um, type and name of the parameter. But what if we, for example, want to you know, look, uh, look for a book that is specific, specific, specific for a, a given, given year? We want this year to be actually a proper year, not an integer um, that you know, can have whatever value. So all we, all we have to do is to create the implicit um, query parameter decoder that will, that will be passed um, inside of the uh, optional blah, 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 and it will do all the, all the magic. So all we, have to, all we have to do, because this is like um, pretty, um, pretty obvious if you have a look at the uh, docs of, of the server, uh, so all we have to do is to create like a, a mapping from, from um, one type to, to another. Okay. Um, so here you can see how it looks, like how the, uh, so this is like the first, the first um, endpoint. And here we have the, the second thing, uh, the one that uh, contains um, query parameters, author and, uh, and here. So if you have a look at the code, it's, it shouldn't be that, that hard to, to read. So we decode, we find that the books like even author, and then we uh, try to fetch books um, for this um, given, uh, given author and here. And we either uh, return a bad request or, or we return um, okay uh, wrapped with this header the custom header that we can encode if we want, uh, because maybe we, we want to um, you know, add something, add some cookie or add some value into, into the, um, or to any, to any other token into our um, header. Or if, um, if there is uh, no year, um, we just uh, do, um, we just get this, this book by author and we do this, we do this as JSON and this is another uh, extension method that comes from HTTP 4S um, and CRC, so we don't have to, you know, um, rewrite everything um, into into super huge string, or we don't have to um, think about how to how to translate our our model to to the JSON. We just call as JSON method uh, because we we defined these um, in our in our build file. All right. Once we have this defined our our endpoints, all we have to do is to uh, build the server. So we have the uh, the router um, that um, is that that handles uh, book routes and and auto routes. Uh, if the route is not um, not found, so if the if the user will uh, call our service with the path that we don't know or uh, with the 
um, impro um, appropriate um, headers or not validated, validated token, which is not the case, for us, we return um, not found. And it does all the magic for, for us. Um, yeah, and the building, building server is like four lines. So we, uh, we provide a custom runtime that we, that we have, uh, define a domain and a host and the, and the port, um, define which, which routes we want to, we want to um, have in our application, and because this is like the IO resource, we we um, we never want to um, we never want to close this. Okay. For other things, because of, we we have just um, seen the gets, but obviously we have more than gets. So sometimes we have to do post, uh, put, or delete, or any other HTTP method. So here you can see uh, how easy it is to handle. Um, handle requests with the with the HTTP for us, because all we all we need to do is to uh, get the JSON, decode this uh, from from requests. Um, once we have uh, our entity, our our model, we just call the repository to you know do whatever logic we we encoded over there. It might be saving or you know doing something like this, and then we return created, which is another custom um, response with the uh, code um, 201 and, and everything. And we, again, we just call as JSON, and it knows how to translate uh, what we provided here to, to a JSON. So, they, so whoever will, um, so the client of our service will know what will uh, be the uh, response, okay? Same for other, um, for other um, HTTP verbs, um, Again, we can um, we can decode things, we can encode them later on, and uh, yeah, we can uh, extend our our paths if we if we want. Uh, luckily, there there is also the integration with Prometheus. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, we haven't used this um, in the project that I'm currently part of. Um, we haven't used this in in production because we use. Another thing that I will I will um, talk to you in a second, but uh, it's actually maintained. Last the last commit was from two weeks ago, so I think it's not that bad. But obviously there are better options than than that. All right, what if we want to add some middleware to our um, to our server? Um, yeah, we can easily um, decide whether we want you know ex expo um, expose some endpoints. Uh, for example, with, with status route. So, uh, you know, we want to do some health check uh, for liveness or readiness probe or whatever. Um, so that's fine. Uh, whoever wants can ask us this and we will, we will give an answer. But if we want to, you know, uh, show some events or, you know, um, get some notification route and, or, you know, um, do other things, we can hi hide this um, behind the uh, authorization. And it's also possible. Because this uh, this middleware is uh, created, uh, it's like a custom, custom middleware. So we created this ourselves. Uh, we do some uh, you know um, header parsing, so we check the uh, permissions, and uh, then we decide whether we we want to allow this user to to um, get the resource that um, is uh, the, that the user is requ requesting for. All right. Uh, same if you if you same if you want to you know manipulate with um, cookies, you can. Uh, um, there is the project uh, called um, Crypto Thirty Seven, if I'm if I'm correct. So it basically allows you to. Um, it's also functional and it actually allows you to uh, to sign some um, to encode and decode some some tokens um, in particular. So you can. You can use this as well, and then validate signed token uh, once you have once you have um, received uh, the real response from the from the server, and want to um, ask for the resource, resource again. So it's all all doable and and possible without like you know you don't have to um, write your own um, crypto analyzer uh, encoder or decoder yourself. 
you just import the stuff and uh, put in a for home comprehension. All right. If you want to do some, um, um, if you want to play with 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 chorus, so if like basically uh, uh, chorus is, uh, if I'm correct, uh, cross origin resource sharing. Um, so it's this mechanism that um, allows some um, some resources in a web page um, to be requested from another domain outside um, the domain from which the first re uh, resource was served. Uh, and we can easily configure this and uh, add to our uh, build server, that build server um, with custom <laughs> with custom setting. Okay, what what if we want to uh, testing test these things? Uh, yeah, it's it's super easy to, to do this because all we all we uh, need to have is, is specs or any other testing um, library that you that you use. And uh, yeah, you can you can do <laughs> unsafe run sync in your in your tests uh, easily to you know run the thing, run the I/O and see with uh, what requests that's a um, given um, endpoint uh, response to, to your uh, request. Okay, so is it like the best thing to use this um, HTTP4S? We, um, we have just saw this um, easy to read and easy to use DSL that contains some, um, you know, um, all the things that we need. So it contains middleware, course um, um, it contains you know some validation middleware we can you know play with this this pretty pretty easily but there are better ways um, to use HTTP 4s one of uh, one of them is to have declarative API so um, why even like need or need should use the um, API um, so I've just shown you um, the um, implementation of some of some endpoints, and the thing is that they are tightly coupled to to the server. So if we want to move from you know one day, um, there was this recent thing with with uh, Lightband, so they put huge license, so we have to pay crazy money for for the license. Um, so if we want to migrate from AKHTP, um, AKHTP to HTTP4S, we would have to rewrite everything. If we want to migrate from HTTP4S to Zio HTTP, um, we'll have to rewrite everything. We'll have to rewrite, you know, whole uh, whole API layer because this the logic and how it all works is tightly coupled to this specific library. It's not reusable because we did have to like, if we wanted to have things like, for example, some validation or um, some kind of authorization or um, you know, we wanted to add some um, headers to to each request, or we want to check some headers in each uh, in uh, request uh, in each request. Then we would have to write the code every single time, and we don't want we don't like this as, as software devs. We want to re, uh, reuse our our pieces of software, our building blocks. Um, and there is no there there is no such uh, such a thing with uh, easy integration with docs. In most cases, you would have to um, play with YAML uh, and write YAML uh, yourself, um, and it's not possible to generate this. So whenever um, whenever the API changes, each time you will have to rewrite thing with your uh, with your bare hands, which is not ideal because it would be it would be nice if we could um, have some integration. Okay, so what are the possibilities of having um, API. So we either um, uh, write a YAML code and we use something like Open SBT generator so we can have the client code out of the YAML or for the documentation we have some code and we generate some, uh, some uh, YAML file that, will, that can be you know, consumed by Swagger or, or another thing that you have. Okay. So there are actually three libraries that I would personally recommend. I've used two of them, which is Tapir. Uh, made by Software Mill and, and Endpoint4S, which is pretty good also. 
Uh, but I think Tapir is number one. There's also the Type API project, uh, but I haven't used this, but you know, just for the sake of knowing that um, something like this exists. Okay, so a um, few things that, that, Tapir, that Tapir has. Um, it's type, type safety, so again, uh, compile time um, guarantees um, correctness. Um, you can separate uh, the shape of your endpoint um, from um, the, like the what from the server logic, which is the how, how you do something, how you, how you um, expose uh, things. It does have the um, open API and Swagger integrations. Um, it does, it is like another layer of abstraction. I've mentioned, it's so important that I have mentioned this twice actually. Uh, but what it gives us, like if we want to migrate from um, Akka to HTTP4S or any other direction, if we have the API definitions used separately or compiled separately, it would be way easier because we just uh, interpret those um, endpoints and put in, into another uh, server. But we'll, we'll have a look at this uh, in a second. And uh, yeah, last but not least, it's a um, library, not a, not a framework. So it has many integrations. So it, it plays nicely with Akka ACP, um, ACP4S, uh, Zio, uh, Play as well. And it's maintained. In the open source uh, world, it's, it's super important to have like a, like a company or a leader uh, behind the, uh, this piece of software. All right, um, so how Tapir works? Um, it's pretty easy because we have like a generic endpoint that we can um, move to be like a base endpoint. So in, the, uh, in this endpoint, we can define what will be the um, um, error type. In this case, it's like a string and the uh, first par uh, part of our path. Uh, if you want to create, um, if you want to create the, for example, um, add book endpoint, we just use this um, base endpoint and work on this. So we basically pass the values, um, pass some parameters, maybe you know define the uh, the JSON body that we want to receive, which will will be um, uh, provided by the by the uh, within the request, and uh, you know we might add some description, uh, maybe some some example, and we we can expect this um, uh, to be. We can also expect uh, this header to be to be present. If we want, if we, for example, want to, you know, define the um, that each uh, of our endpoints sh should be encrypted, or you know, each request that we that we will receive should have this token, we can easily move this to to be a part of the um, base end, uh, base endpoint. But we can easily uh, reuse this this thing. Uh, so in this example, it's a bit more a bit, a bit more um, complicated. But still um, easy to easy uh, for a, a person who just joined project to, to read and to contribute to. Um, we can define the error type. We can define um, other things like um, paging. Um, obviously, here we we just use the we just use the uh, uh, values like long um, and uh, and integers. But if we want, for example, to you know wrap this. To, into like a separate case class, like pagination or whatever, and we want to have two parameters, we can also decode, it, decode this. So it will be more like a domain uh, specific language, uh, but still we will um, have all the functional functionality that Tapir um, can give us. Uh, yet again, we can use uh, things we defined here uh, to um, either get users with this, with this paging or um, get single user with this with this ID, um, defining uh, some uh, part of uh, path over um, over here. All right. So once we have our once we have our our endpoints defined, what can we what can we do with them? We need to add them to the routes. That we have um, created with DSL previously. So instead of defining this DS, the, this, this route with um, uh, HTTP for S directly, all we have to do is to provide 
these things, like we have to interpret these things using the um, ACP4S interpreter um, to routes that ACP4S can consume, can expose, and, uh, and pass them when we, um, when we, build, the, when we build our, um, our server. Okay, so it's, it's pretty easy because we, we define them once, we reuse them, we pass them to any, any sort of interpreter that we want to have. It might be ACP4S, it might be Zio, it might be, again, Akka, everything you, everything you want or everything you, you will find um, an integration to and pass them into the, into the builder. Okay, uh, so how can we um, couple our API definition with the, um, with the server logic itself? So we want to define what we do. So we want to define what is endpoint we will do, what kind of, um, what kind of um, action it will execute with our system. And we do this by providing the, the thing um, which is called um, server security, um, uh, sorry, server, uh, so, uh, sorry, so server logic. So in, inside of the server logic, by the way, to show you the, the, this, the, th the same thing in, with different fla flavors, this one is using uh, ACK uh, HTTP, okay? So all we, all we have to do, we define our, um, our endpoint, which again is, um, is using some security, defines um, error, um, error um, uh, body and um, other, other things, and path, and we use this uh, and define what it will actually execute. You can call any, any service that, the, that you want here, any service that you have um, implemented. Okay, what about the stability? Yet again, um, the, the library itself uh, gives us um, things like a Tapir Stab Interpreter, which will provide us the, um, the backend that we, can, that, we can, that we can use. So once we have this, this, uh, this, um, this stab, we can create the, uh, create the request as we would send this with any other backend, like, you know, um, like a proper backend, not a stab, but we use the, but we use the stab backend to send this request. So we, uh, so we can easy, easily assert um, against, uh, these, against these uh, values. Okay, um, how Tapir and OpenAPI work together So from time to time we have to expose some some docs, or maybe you know someone um, encourages um, us politely to expose some docs. Uh, with um, Open API um, integration, once we have our our endpoint, it might be a list of endpoints here that are you know defined within our um, within our uh, system. We just have to use this um, interpreter to create Open Open API uh, Open API. Um, file. Um, yet again, what if we want to, you know, use Swagger interpreter? Um, can we even use, um, you know, Swagger interpreter we, within um, HTTP4S? We want to have documentation and we want to, uh, you know, serve this this logic with our endpoints at the same time. Um, yeah. So firstly, we we interpret those with with uh, Swagger. We, you know, add some um, things like. Um, versioning, uh, and we yet again we uh, um, interpret those Swagger endpoints into the uh, HTTP for us um, end, um, endpoints, so the HTTP for us will be able to consume them. Okay, uh, yeah, yet again, that's, it's it's also possible. This is the short example how to do this with with Zio. We define the uh, the public endpoint, the you know the base endpoint, whatever we call this. Then we provide this to uh, Zio HTTP interpreter, so the Zio can execute this logic with the Zio um, effect um, and can serve those um, over over here, okay? Because as we have this interpreter, Zio HTTP will know how to how to serve them. And yet again, we have this, this Swagger uh, interpreter for Zio as well. Okay, for we we. Um, for the vast majority of the time, we have to consume some, you know, some, some things like JSON. In most cases, maybe maybe XML. Uh, for for some of you, 
We have plenty of choices. I think one of the most popular is Circe. I will not go uh, read deep into, into this, just, just um, describing, describing this roughly. Um, so uh, yeah, it's functional, you know, it gives you uh, automatic or, or semi-automatic deri derivation, which basically means that you can have uh, your, your class and it will have, um, if you add this, um, those things, um, it will be derived, which means it will be either decoded or encoded um, to JSON or from JSON, which is pretty easy and uh, we all do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, uh, what if you want to generate some API? I have shown you already some examples, um, so we will not get um, deeply again into, into this. Uh, what if we want to talk to another service? Uh, some of you might use Kafka, some of you might still use um, um, uh, synchronous calls using um, HTTP um, clients. So with HTTP, what we can do is, again, using functionally um, correct um, code, we can um, create a almost like read like English um, type of request uh, that has some method, content type, uh, um, some uh, token, if we want some defined by, by us um, body, which is JSON, and, and expect some response. And yet again, like in Tapiro, this is our, just the description. It's not sending anything, it's not um, executing anything. It will only be executed if we um, send this with our um, backend. So here we create this backend as a resource. Obviously we'll have to release this at some point. Uh, and once we have this search entity with uh, appropriate values, we can send this to the um, to the client. Uh, sorry, to the to the server that we that we want to hit. That is uh, hiding um, behind this this URL. Uh, it's easy to test uh, because uh, it comes with the uh, some helpers method that can um, that can give us some some hints on how to test and uh, will help us to write. Uh, testable and yet uh, readable, um, readable test to ensure correctness. Uh, yeah, uh, observability. From time to time we have to add some metrics. Um, I keep saying this from time to time, which for some of you, uh, at least for me, is like every day. We have to play with some metrics. We have to see, you know, we have to add some counters, um, you know, work with some uh, gauge um, or um, other, other Likewise, um, things, diagrams. So um, with Tapir, it's way easier to do than uh, comparing to HTTP for S. Why? Mostly because um, we can have this. Uh, our uh, we, ha we can define this um, metrics instance. We can uh, customize our interceptors to use this um, this um, interceptors that comes with the uh, Prometheus metrics instance that we have just created, then we again can um, interpret routes that we want to, that we want to measure. Um, and that's it. You don't have to do any more configuration. You have to just, just add uh, Prometheus to your Docker, Docker Compose to play with this stuff. Um, and consume them and, and uh, create super uh, useful diagrams and uh, enjoy. All right. Um, these are the defaults that comes, default metrics that comes, um, that comes with the uh, library. If you want to, you know, add something more, be more fancy and uh, add something fancier than, than just you know using this histogram or or like uh, diagrams, you can do this as well. So you, I'm not gonna do into go into internals of, of this. Uh, it's um, Future, which means ACA HP based, uh, but you again you define some labels. It's more like a Prometheus type of thing. It's not. It has nothing to do with with um, uh, Tapir, but uh, it's easy to embed this this um, logic into 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 Tapir. At the end of the uh, once you have your your metrics defined, again we create our uh, our instance and provide some uh, custom um, custom responses that we have just implemented over here. All right, um, coming to an end, um, stack that I can confirm and uh, 
I can, you know, um, surely uh, say that it was at least uh, battle tested in my case, uh, which might be not enough for you, which is which is all right. Uh, is for the at least for the API layer, uh, it's actually this. So uh, we have some description of the APIs here, uh, with with defined with uh, Tapir uh, ACP 4 s which is our um, server logic. Uh, CRC, we use this for the, for decoding things. Um, SCP to fetch some um, data f uh, from external libraries. Sorry, external um, uh, external ser uh, services. Prometheus to to uh, do some uh, counting and and, and metrics um, with the Swagger and and Open API. Okay, um, I told you at the beginning about you know uh, other things. So there is much more than this, even at the, at the, uh, at the API layer. Because there was like GraphQL, uh, we were talking about uh, REST today, mostly. Um, we didn't talk about gRPC. We were talking about pure JSONs. We didn't talk about like any performance at all. We uh, didn't talk about like serverless, how to implement this, whether it's possible even to implement this with, within Scala ecosystem or within the libraries that I have, that I have mentioned. Uh, there is Smithy with uh, Smithy, Smithy for, us, for us, which is yet another uh, you know possibility to define your define your um, mm, endpoints. Um, so yeah, uh, it's way more to be discovered um, and way more to um, to have a look at. Uh, let me show you something uh, briefly because like talk is, talk is cheap. Show me the code. Okay. Oh, okay. Can you see anything? Okay. 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 Uh, just okay. I'll mirror the screens. Okay. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, yes, it should be this. Okay, just a second. Fine. Uh, uh, okay, I want to show you. Um, I'm not sure how to do this. Just okay. Let me. Uh, okay. okay uh, let's start over and see some code. Uh, Let me just increase the font. Okay. It's Linux. Yes, yeah, Linux. Control Alt. Doesn't work. Alt Shift. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so just real quick, I'll show you the. Um, okay. So here I have uh, some endpoints defined, defined that uh, you know um, contain some base endpoint with some description. Uh, it also have some um, paging that we um, I bet you have um, seen in the presentation, and uh, yeah, two endpoints to 
um, get all users and uh, get a specific user. Here we have a server. So the server is um, having um, two interpreters. So one of them is Swagger, and the other one is um, HTTP for um, for S that in, uh, interprets um, any endpoint. Um, the, sorry, app endpoint. The other one is interpreting the um, the Swagger because we want to expose the Swagger docs to the external world, world as well. And uh, yeah, that's how we that's how we build the 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 server over here. Let me. Okay. Let's run it just just quickly. All right. So in okay. So I have um, you have seen the um, the endpoint definition. You have seen the server. So um, I will show you okay quickly. Uh, so this is the uh, the client. So. Once we have the tap here, we can also not only generate, not only have this, this uh, working out of the box um, API descriptions with these uh, docs, but we can also have the client. So it's, a, it's actually a great thing because um, for the sake of integration tests, for example, you might want to call the same endpoints directly as it is um, defined, but from, the, from the another, another service because you want to uh, you know, um, be sure that it actually works. So if you want, if you uh, provide those um, those endpoints, uh, the client will be generated itself. I will show you that it works. Yeah. So we actually received the, the user because we called the um, get user get user endpoint. Yet again, just quickly, uh, some docs. So once we once we run this. I create. I will create two files, uh, JSON and YAML. So, um, yeah. okay. So this is like uh, created uh, thanks to thanks to Tapir and thanks to each um, interceptor. You don't have to you know do anything about that. Um, it works and uh, it uh, it's 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 pretty it's pretty fast. Um, Okay. Last thing I want to. Okay. Okay, and the last thing that is nice is this um, the Swagger um, that can you know uh, help you test your endpoints and uh, in a pretty like um, even with with such a great dev experience you can you know call some um, endpoints within um, this um, terminal. You can see some descriptions of what needs to be sent, how the, how the JSON should be defined, what the what the, um, uh, what this endpoint uh, takes or or ex or exposes the external external uh, world. Okay. Okay, it's 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 way harder than oh. I would expect it to be. Okay. Last slide doesn't want to work. Okay. Okay, just a second because I'll have like two slides that I want to. Um, show you, and they are actually
some technical problems, but it is what it is. All right. Um, All right, a um, few things. Um, okay, some special thanks. So thanks for your patience, uh, first of all. Thanks for, the, uh, for, for coming here. Um, thanks for everyone who's contributing to the open source and, and is using um, this with some feedback. So, the, so this, this um, OSS guards can um, make some fixes. Mm, yeah, thanks, uh, Ukash, uh, iterators, and, and Sumologic for, for having me. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here because I think we have slightly run out of time. But uh, I'll have one request. If you can log to this and, and leave a feedback, it's like literally one question whether you enjoy this talk or not. It's like a QR code. If you can scan this with your, uh, with your um, phone, I would really appreciate this. And uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's all. If you have any questions, I'm, I'll be here for, uh, for some time at least. So uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you. So are there any questions right now? We can talk in the hallway, but we can. There's a question. One question. Um, how have your Scala tech stack evolved um, since you started out with Scala a few years ago? Yeah, sure. So the question is how. Uh, um, how the stack uh, evolved. So, um, luckily, I was, I think, you know, using Play at the beginning um, in my in my in my project. And so we did have some we did have some legacy. So we um, obviously we did some Scala uh, migration because we also did have some services in um, Scala 2.11. So like the main Scala, uh, we, we we moved to Scala 3 now, uh, which is like you know it has some major changes. We also used um, play, so we get rid of um, of play for the sake of um, actually HTTP, uh, ACK HTTP, but then we then we uh, moved towards uh, exactly HTTP 4S and and Tapir and, and this the software Windows things, which is HTTP as well. Um, and here yeah, I think I think that's that's it. We you know we we contributed to this. Uh, we want this to be to be stable uh, within the uh, you know um, and like. Industry tested, not just academia tested. So, uh, yeah, I would say like from, you know, more like uh, playish uh, applications towards um, towards Tapir HTTP for us. Uh, now we are trailing Zio and uh, but like with Zio, the, the the issue is that um, it's not very stable yet. I think it has just a like, few contributors. There is like no uh, major version of the um, Zio HTTP. Um, I think it's still in, in, in red at least. That is a good question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions, maybe? Okay, okay maybe one more. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what open source are you contributing to? Uh, mostly Tapir and, and SD3, because I know the guys, and uh, I think it's like they have. Um, Pretty good. The um, the pace when they when they answer for your for your request with, with an issue or uh, you know pull request or whatever, it's it's, it's pretty, pretty pretty fast. And uh, I did I do have some contributions contributions to Zio because uh, yeah I think the guys are like always happy to jump on the call and, and pair with you. So uh, I think that's pretty awesome as well. So you recommend contributing to those projects? Because oh yeah, example, definitely. They have some experience from. Um, I started contributing to HTTP for us, and it was like almost impossible to uh, to get something approved and merged uh, because of the you know, review phase. Yeah. I don't know, maybe it's, it was my experience, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. For 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 some project, uh, it, it really is is hard to get get um, you know um, approvals in in a sense that the pace uh, you know can you know the closing the the pull request can take like. Over a month or something, which, which is like not the pace we are. I think we are used to because like um, we want to have like you know rapid and, and small changes and, and, and have those changes to release very often. Um, I think I would, if if you if you are uh, if you want to you know get into uh, contributions, I would say um, software wheels things that like the guys that that um, like part of their their time is spent is, is being spent on the uh, you know open source. So like it's their kind of work. So it's it's pretty it's pretty nice because they you know they can answer anything, um, and I would say Zio as well is I think for the um, you know um, 
the first time contributors, um, this is pretty is pretty good because even if you don't know Zion, they there 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 will be someone who can help with this. So uh, yeah, I would say. Okay, oh, thank you for yours. No, no, that's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I guess that's time for a networking break. There's pizza over there, there are beers in that fridge, in that one as well. Use your time, eat pizza, drink beer, and enjoy. And see you after break. Okay, so welcome after our break. Um, I think we can start. So uh, now, uh, Michal, we let you know how to treat your insomnia using Scala. Okay, good luck. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, so types of techniques for a better sleep at night. This is the topic uh, for today. Uh, a few words about me. Uh, my name is Michal. I came all the way from Wrocław to visit you today. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm a software engineer in Ocado, where I do Scala. Uh, I work there for like three years now, doing Scala all the time, mostly with type level stack, but I also do some OSS. Uh, two projects that I maintain are listed here. Uh, some time ago, I've been SRE, where I also have had the pleasure to maintain live systems. Uh, discussable if it's a really a pleasure. Currently, I'm building a business critical software. So you can imagine there are some automated warehouses having robots in it. They have to work 24 seven because they do outbound during the day, inbound during the night. So errors can be uh, really painful. You all know errors, right? Having problems with production. How many of you 
have to support like live production systems, raise your hand. Okay, somewhere around the half. Uh, so you know the drill. There are the moments when phone wakes you up because something is not working and you have to help fixing this, right? Uh, so I want to talk about errors for a bit now. Uh, I have divided errors into two like categories. The first one is uh, runtime errors. So let's, let's have a story. Uh, let's imagine you're having a great sleep at night. It was a difficult day. Uh, suddenly your phone rings and it's not like the person you would like to hear from. It's pager duty or whatever alerting system you have. And it uh, wakes you up because production system is down. So you have to figure it out. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. You hardly remember how uh, what your name is, and there is someone who says that they are unable to do their work because, well, the system they rely on is down. So it's not a very pleasant situation. Uh, I know some of you have been there. By the sunrise, you figure it out, hopefully. Uh, you're on your own because you're the only one on support. And uh, this is how you look the next day, right? Because you have to go to work, you have to do your job, perhaps attend uh, your business. End of story. Uh, does it sound cool? Doesn't. Yeah, so the second kind of errors, compile time errors. Uh, another story. So you woke up after the good sleep you had. You're in your home office or in your office. And then wild compile error appears. And guess what? You also have to figure it out. It's not, not less difficult than the one on the night shift, right? But there is no pressure from someone who is telling you that the production system is down because it's on your computer, right? Then, because you're in the office, there are your colleagues to help you figure it out, to solve it. Uh, so are you not on your own with it? After some time you sorted out, the code didn't meet production system because it was broken on your end, and uh, by the end of the day, you can have a great sleep at night. Sounds better, right? End of story. So wrapping up, uh, to have a comparison, runtime errors can have a significant influence on your production system and on your business eventually, right? Because if the system is down, it doesn't make money. It perhaps, uh, perhaps this is a problematic for your business as well. And uh, compile time errors happen when you work developing your production systems, and only then. So I would claim that compile time errors are much better than runtime. Is it right? <laughs> Sounds correct. OK, so can we go this way? Can we move from runtime to compile time? Well, uh, if it was not possible, I wouldn't be talking to you today. So yes, and we will learn how to do this with Scala. Uh, based on some examples. So here they are, type safe techniques for a better sleep at night. And uh, funny enough, uh, Marcin on the previous talk has covered some of my talk, so it will, will not be as long as, as I intended. Uh, but yeah, there is something unique into it anyway. So let's have another story. Let's think of a system that we have to design. Uh, this will be a very chilly system that allows the QA to order a beer. And our job is to model a domain. So imagine we are very lazy this day and we try to implement the, the domain model like that. So ordering a beer basically means providing a quantity, but we were lazy and we've provided it with a string. Not the best choice, right? On the left-hand side, you can see that there are two like valid use cases, uh, but also you have to test against all those cases when someone wants a pint of beer, pomidor, no anything. So let's, let's go forward, let's maybe use double. Double is better because it basically eliminates all the strings, but it's not the best. Uh, then let's say we go idiomatic Scala, use int. We don't have nulls, we don't have those dot something, but we have negatives, we have zero. And uh, basically the, the standard library doesn't help you a lot more with that, right? You can't go any further, you have to test your system against values that are negative, zeros. You have to write some code for that, right? But then you can have 
something that is called refined types uh, that allow you to put another constraint on your type. So it's not like memory level constraint, but rather something that you add to the type uh, to limit the set of values it can take. And as you can see, it only allows the values that we want to have, right? So sounds cool because we don't have to write code to test for the values we don't want to have, right? And also, uh, refined is not limited to ints, of course. You can have multiple other uh, types. For example, you want to have a string that's valid UUID or anything like that. You want to have post int so you can see that the second line will not compile. Those are just compile time errors, right? You want to have validation against, I don't know, XML or even or odd numbers, right? So this is basically something that a uh, refined li library provides you with. You can, of course, have your own validators. You can validate strings based on some regexp, regexp and, and so on, or perhaps combine the existing ones. So this is kind of flexible. And uh, yeah, so we had this artificial example. Let's have something more real world like. Uh, so we're gonna model an order that can be taken by your ecom system, for example. So order is built with lines, and each line is a product and the quantity, right? So we want the product name or ID of some sort, and then the quantity. So with the quantity, we've seen it, right? It, it, it is something that we want to have like a positive because people should not be ordering negative amount of beer from your web shop, right? We'll get there. Well. If we define the order line this way, uh, you can see that it will take the right data, but it will also allow for the invalid data. So if we want to move on this way, uh, we should implement some sort of logic that will allow us to validate the input, right? So you can have the product, but we need to check if the name is empty. You can have the quantity, but you need to verify if the quantity is not negative and it kind of works. But you need to use the right constructor, you need to settle for, for using safe apply or something like that. Uh, it's not very intuitive and you had to write the code. Uh, yeah, so let's see if we can do it a better way. Uh, if we can think of drawbacks just before proceeding with refined, uh, compiler doesn't help as much with, with that it can't validate like uh, row uh, instances of the class. Uh, we need to write tests, but uh, the other thing, maybe the most important, is how do you uh, cooperate with JSON libraries? So the JSON library could derive a codec, but will not know about the whole stuff around validating your data, data right? So you need to validate post decoding. So it's not very pleasant. Let's do it better way. Uh, so let's use refined. You know post int, right? Because we showed it on the previous slide. Uh, we wanted the product to be a non-empty string and voila, you have a type for that. So it basically covers you with, with this input. So if you want to produce a valid order line, it will compile, but the second line will not compile because you provided an empty string. And of course, during the runtime, uh, the decoder will not accept it. Basically, if you try to decode as, uh, a JSON that has this empty string in it and try to pass it to the decoder, it will just fail decoding. So clearly some advantages, we have compile time checks. We don't have to write tests for that because we just use it li like, like the regular types. The code is much cleaner because we just wrote one line and, and put some imports to our file. Uh, and uh, I would say that this is self-documenting because you have your intent about the non-negativity, non-emptiness right there in your code, in your domain model, because basically it's like inherent to your domain model that something has to be non-empty or positive, right? And you don't have to look for a special additional logic somewhere else. And uh, you have out of the box support in CRC, but not only there, there are multiple uh, integrations for refined, for example, for database, uh, data, encoding, stuff like that.
So clearly some advantages, but there are things to remember at least. So you have to be very careful about choosing type constraints on your data because if you do this prematurely and you don't cover one case, then you have to uh, change types uh, and, and uh, refactor your API further, right? So if you had a case when a description, for example, was acceptable if, if it's empty and you put non-empty string, then the refactoring goes from the top to the very bottom in your application, right? Then uh, the other thing is that refine is not your domain type. So like in the example before, uh, I have used product non-empty string and quantity posint, you might do, want to uh, wrap those with any val, right? So you, you just basically create two additional case classes that, uh, that encapsulate the ID and stuff like that. Because then it happens to be the right domain type. And uh, you have to remember that refine adds some additional runtime overhead. If performance is critical for you, then you might want to consider if this is a good idea. Cool. Uh, is that all? Well, here comes Tapir, and this is something that Machin already covered, but uh, I want to share a different perspective on Tapir because we will try to integrate uh, refined types with CRC with Tapir uh, in some sort of a trivial API, and perhaps if, if you were overwhelmed with the examples, this is gonna be a very basic one, so perhaps it's, it's easier to follow. Uh, and the final version that, that I'm gonna show you is available uh, in the repository. There is a link, there is a QR code if you're interested in it, so don't worry, you'll be able to, to, to use it, fork it, anything. Cool. Starting with the domain, we will, we will want to build a system that takes orders, so not only order lines, but whole order uh, to our web shop system, something like that. And we want to val validate if the order just, if it's correct. We don't want to do anything further, just validate it. So we know the order line already. Uh, the order, well, it has an ID, which is a string refined with UUID. And uh, we want the order to have at least one line because basically it makes no sense to order something but with no content, right? Uh, interesting thing is, uh, the non-empty list is actually a data type from cats. So this is nothing from refined, but they play well together. So I wanted to, to highlight that as well. Cool, we have the model. We want to be able to convert the model to JSON and backwards because we want the, the, the web service to be able to, to do the same. So let's use uh, Circe for that. I put companion objects there and defined uh, codex. As you can see, and this is very similar to what Martin showed you in the previous talk, talk, you just derive the codex. So even though we use non-empty string, refined stuff like that, we don't have to do anything more than just add a handful of imports that provide the compatibility layer. There is nothing extra to it. So I think this is, this is very convenient, right? Now we have the model, we have the codex, what do we need next? Let's define the endpoint, right? We, we know how to convert the data from JSON and forwards. We want to build an endpoint. So the, the endpoint will take a data in form of JSON, then do something, black box, whatever it is, and either return 200 for su success or 400 for a failure. Uh, so let's define our, an endpoint. Quick recap of, of what you already know from the previous talk, uh, we define an endpoint by starting with the basic endpoints that, that has units all over around. We say that it will, it will take a post uh, method, then a path that we want it to be available on. So in this case, it's a validate. You can see that it maps to, for if I start the server locally, you can see localhost slash validate. Um, then, if we know what's the path, we need to tell Tapir what's the input type. In our case, this is an input in form of JSON body that takes a type of order, and uh, that, that's basically it. 
And uh, JSON body output, basically, we, we rely on the HTTP codes, so it can be unique. It's not very important. I want to highlight this line because it, te it tells Tapir a lot, and I mean a lot. Tapir will not accept any other data on this input. So it will wait for, an, for a JSON that is shaped like a valid order, including all the restrictions that we put on it using the non-empty list, non-empty string, positive end, stuff like that. So let's move forward. If we have the endpoint like declaration, what we're gonna need more? In Tapir, we need to connect the definition with like a logic for the endpoint and then build a route and start the server, right? So ne the next thing is building the logic and this is the logic. If you're a bit familiar with Scala, what does it do? It does nothing. So thanks to Refined and Circe and how they cooperate, we, we did not write a logic and we have what we intended because the compiler works for us. So there is no thing like uh, our system got like invalid JSON and we failed with the validation somewhere in the runtime because we did not foresee something coming. We basically have it encoded in types. And then let's just combine the endpoint, so the validate endpoint from the previous slide with the logic that basically does nothing. Let's match the types and we have it. We have a root that does nothing in the logic to produce the output. Okay. Uh, we have it, then there is the boring stuff, so to say. So we need to build a server out of it. You've seen it in the previous slides. So just to have a quick recap, we build a handful of routes. We provide the validate to interpreter. So we want to interpret Tapir as something runnable. Then we build the server as in the previous presentation and then run it, use forever. So have it like running forever until you press control C and that's it. That's the whole service we wanted to build. It's not too much code, I guess. And uh, let's prove it, let's, let's have it tested. So first, like a valid example to have the, the correct path, we provide a JSON, so order ID is the valid UID, we have some lines, product is non-empty, quantity is positive, so we expect like a correct response, so we have okay. You can see HTTP one, 200 okay, and an empty JSON because we put a unit and the unit is converted to like empty object. Then if we put like empty object to this endpoint, so the first like invalid case, we can have in, an info that we expected order ID and some lines and then some other tests. If we build like structurally valid JSON but with negative quantity, you can see that we have failed to match the predicate for the positivity. Then the test of empty list, you can also see that it expected at least one line and it has failed. So pretty impressive for like zero lines of logic, right? There is a bonus. Uh, it was spoiled because Martin already <laughs> told you that you can generate uh, open API documentation from your uh, endpoints and it takes like few lines of code. Then there is the extra bonus, another spoiler from Martin. <laughs> so you can generate the clients. If you want to build a service that uses the first one, you just basically uh, take the endpoint definition and build like a valid client. So with the, the most simple pattern, you can have a method that just, using your, that just uses your service. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's wrap up what we went through. We have endpoint definitions that are like compiled and verified by the compiler. You have data validation for free with combination uh, with refined. You can have the logic plugged very easily because the logic basically is a separate function, right? Someone else can do the stuff around tap your HTTP for us and you can have someone else to produce the functions itself without knowing the, the things around. Uh, it seamlessly interoperates with the system, with the ecosystem. You have seen cooperation with CRC, but Martin told you more about it, so I'm not going to details. And uh, if you want to play with this example, you're more than welcome. Uh, it's on my GitHub. 
And now if you want to have the link, there is the QR code if you wish to scan it. Yeah, waiting for some uh, phones to go down. I will also share it in the comments in the, on the Meet site if you, if you weren't able to, to catch it now. So this is the end. Thank you. If you want to stay in contact, there are some links. Uh, I will also show the, the link to the presentation. If you have any questions, I guess this is the best time for that. And thank, thank you. you. Yeah, uh, Marcin. Questions for your presentation? Uh, first question I have is how refined types um, operate with more like complex constraints. So for example, I have like, you know, I want this uh, integer to be from a range from like zero to you know, 100. Uh, can, it, can it handle something like this? Or, for example, um, it's quite a common case where I want to validate an email. I want this like you email to be under this separate like concrete reg regex expression or um, you know uh, any other regex that yep. not 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 necessarily uh, it not it doesn't have to be necessarily an email. Uh, does it have this like capabilities out of working out of the box? Uh, yes. So just to to re repeat the question. Complex cases of refinement types like my own regex or complex uh, ranges of numbers, and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Refine provides you with the combinators that you can have, like number greater than, less than, and you can also create your own refinements, so to say, based on the regexes. So you can, for example, provide a regex that is. Uh, only matching like numbers or only matching like letters or something like that. Emails, if you have your own regex for that as well. Thanks. Uh, I one. Okay, I wanted to ask the same question, but I also have another question. Uh, is it possible to uh, prove that uh, given piece of logic, uh, for example, takes in some refined type and uh, returns some refined type? And probably not, but. I don't know if I get the question I mean, right. Uh, uh, some kind of proof that, for example, you get non-empty string and looking uh, compiler looks at your program and tells that returns non-empty string. Yeah. So uh, if I can make sure that the refinement types go right. So yes, you can write tests. I think Shapeless provides something like that. That you can build a test that verifies if given code compiles or does not compile. So you can build a test just to double check uh, if what you modeled really should not compile or should compile. That's the one way. Or for example, we want to build like end-to-end -end test for an endpoint like this one and uh, just put some input and check if it really responded with like negative answer, right? Like an error that it did not accept an empty uh, input. Yeah, sure. Uh, do those refined uh, types show somehow in the generated documentation? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know if I have it in this example. We can quickly go back. Uh, you can see that uh, the non-empty list has been there. Uh, the order ID has actually been done in the string, but I compiled it a while ago, so I'm not sure if it, uh, if it changes. But uh, I think they'll just, uh, you know, convert to the, to the uh, like, primitive types they have been refined on top of. Because this is the closest you can get, like, in other languages, right? Does it work with opac types? Uh, I haven't tried it, to be fair. Uh, I imagine this um, opac types are, like, uh, they don't shadow it. I mean, you can have opac types that basically uses refine because you just hide it. Uh, regarding Scala 3 compatibility overall, uh, refine is compiled to Scala 3, but there is one drawback. Uh, you've seen the example previously when I assign uh, like the value. Uh, let me quickly go back. Yeah, the verification like that. So I put just a regular string in this place, but I have this uh, refined auto, and it like raises the value to the context of refined, 
I think this macro is not yet running on Scala 3 because there is something in the macro system missing that enabled this feature. But I know this is being worked on, so I guess they will soon have this sorted out. Any more questions? Uh, how sure. do you convert um, the non defined types to the defined types? Because I imagine you can take the values uh, from, from many other sources and Yes. Yes. So the question is, how do you raise like existing value to the refined uh, context? You can do this, and so basically there is like a macro refined dot refine mv, and you provide the type, and it uh, returns an either. So either you have validated the type and you have the right value, or you have the left hand side. So this is very convenient because. Uh, you, you have no other option to do this on runtime and you have to either like uh, carefully ignore it if you're very sure about that or properly handle the left hand side of the either so like go the, the regular path and uh, yeah that's the way and, and follow up question uh, do you actually put these refined types uh, in your endpoint definitions or you actually or you put the non-refined types and you refine it later uh, because I, I imagine uh, sometimes you need to actually uh, plug in some logic for, for the failed uh, validation. I don't know, you, you try to hunt the client who sends uh, an invalid value and do with all this automatic conversion, you cannot do that because it's too, too simple, right? Uh, in production system, uh, in my case, we use uh, refinement types uh, and they work well. Uh, in case of like fade values, we would rather rely on metrics and uh, tracing to see who issued the request. So we basically can trace uh, on like uh, on New Relic, for example, or other tracing uh, methodology, who issues requests that fails that that do fail often, and just uh, trace it back like that. And also in, in logs, if you do tracing, then you should be able to to trace that. that. Anyone else? Yeah, actually, from my observation, many more projects could use refined types, but the things are choosing not to do so. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering why. Is it like because of lack of familiarity with the library, or there is uh, actually some other disadvantages besides the one that you mentioned, for example, related like to performance? I mean, uh, yeah. So the question is, why is it widely adapted, or yeah, why? more teams are not using refined types. Like, it's, my, it, it's from my observation that uh, it's not that um, widely used. Okay, yeah, so, so the question is why it's not widely adopted. I mean, this is a difficult one because uh, you can be biased about it. In my, around me, in teams around me, this is a popular solution to, to validating data when it makes sense. Uh, I think they can be heavy in terms of when you you want to stick with this refined type, then you have to put it all over your API down there. So if you if you want to decide for it, then it it requires some refactoring. And uh, yeah, I think the familiarity might be the case as well. Some people might not be familiar, but if anyone else know other like reasons. I'm thinking about the case, for example, when you have like very complex ABTs and you need to serialize those. Um, will it make the codex like, much more complicated? No, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, compile times might be increased, right? Because you have to generate all the code below. But, well, we're in the Scala and compilation times are just what they are. Yes, anyone else? Cool. I think we've got it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming. It's not the end. We are heading to after party to Baga Pivo. Uh, Tomek will lead the way. That's Tomek. Uh, there will be like plenty of time to discuss uh, refined types and other types as well, or just anything you would like to discuss. Uh, that, there's plan for another meetup in February, just after Valentine's Day on 15th. 
think that's a perfect day to celebrate your love for Ska. <laughs> uh, so obviously you should you should come. And then uh, in March we hope to host official or unofficial a before party for Ska. Uh, so watch our meetup group for announcements. And yeah. Uh, thank you once again all for coming and uh, thank you uh, Martin Michal for leaving your talks and coming to us.